So thank you for that. And I have a, a message to share from 2 Chronicles 10, so I wanna get in. Anybody ready for the word of God today? They showed up hungry. Let's get into it. Lord, thanks for your word and the power of your spirit. When the spirit and the word combine, there's power. And I pray right now, I, I pray Todd Doxon would be out of the equation. I've showed up by faith to deliver your word. It's your word. And there's many that have showed up here and online. They're, they're ready to receive from you. Help me not get in the way. For those of us here that need to be challenged, I pray we'd embrace and lean into the challenge. Those that need to be encouraged, I pray encouragement would just fly from heaven through this microphone into hearts. There'd be a holy download. And, and every single one of us would walk away different, changed in one way or another, drawn closer to you for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, when you have a big decision to make, who do you go for for advice? You have a big decision in your life. I want you to think about the first couple people that you go to for advice. I was thinking in my life, I've had so many amazing advisors, counselors, people that genuinely have my back. They want me to succeed and thrive. And I'm just grateful. Anybody grateful to God for the people that he surrounded you with throughout the course of your life? I'm thinking about my mom and for, for most kids, knucklehead kids, your parents give great advice, but you're like, they're old, they don't know what they're talking about, right? And so sorry, mom, I put you through that. Great advice my whole life. And it's cool even now, now that I'm actually listening to her, gives just great, you know why she, because she goes right to the word of God and she just delivers advice right from the word. I'm surrounded by a, a board of directors at this church that are just wise, super wise men. Uh, we have an executive team here, men and women, that are just phenomenal. They, they see from different perspectives. Uh, even this, it's funny, this dude on our team, I put out the title of this message. Uh, it was originally advice. It was just one word. And he's like, hey, can I give you some advice on your title? H how about a word of advice? I'm like, dude, good word of advice. I'm gonna take your advice. <laughs> and I just, I'm, I just, I'm grateful for all the people that he's put around me. Most importantly, the Lord, right? But I would say my wife. When we make major decisions, not that I always take her advice, I'm sorry, babe, but I'm so grateful. My children, there's been times where, you know, we're about to take a risk. We're about to send it downfield, and it involves the whole family. Guys, can you guys give me your perspective? It's powerful, and it's so needed. I think there's a lot of uh, mavericks that go, I, I don't need advice. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of do my own thing. And you, it's tragic where that leads to sometimes. For so many years, that was me until God entered my life. I'm wondering where you're at. What decisions do you need to make right now? What do I do in my marriage right now? We've been kind of going through it. Do we fight for the marriage? Do we tap? What do we do? And who do you go for for the counseling? Someone with a, a biblical perspective that's gonna give you truth even if you don't really like what, you, what you're gonna hear? Or do you kind of advice shop and you go to the people that you know will eventually tell you what you really wanna hear? What should I do about my parenting? I got these crazy teenagers. I don't know what to do. Who do we go to? There's a couple people with, we're my parents with teenagers. Let me just stop and pray for you real quick. Let's lay hands on, on every one of y'all. Do we start the business? Do I make a career change? What's next in my life? Who do you go to? There's a story that you read this week. In fact, it was yesterday. 
in our daily reading. And um, if sometimes you take Saturday off for your daily reading, uh, I'll give you, <laughs> I'm gonna bring you up to speed. There was a new king that needed to make some tough decisions and big decisions on how he was gonna lead the nation of Israel. His daddy, King Solomon, who was this amazing king, by the way. I mean, the wisest dude to ever live. He was rich, he was powerful. He built God's temple. Remember David hooked him up with all the resource. This guy was a super successful, powerful king. And now his son Rehoboam, everybody say Rehoboam. We'll, we'll call him King Ray for this study. He's now the new king. And he's taking the reins, he's taking this new job. And he's got some key decisions to make. How do I lead this country? How do I lead these people that God has entrusted to me? Do I lead like my dad? King Solomon was a great king, but he was building all kinds of stuff, and so he needed a lot of resource, so he taxed the people like crazy. I know we don't have to deal with taxes here in the United States, but that's what they did back then. And Solomon was taxing like a wild man, and he had this forced labor, and it was a little out of hand to maintain the growth and the vision that Solomon had. So Rehoboam, do I do that? Do I continue on like that? Or do I kind of ease up a little bit in this season? Do I kind of go a little soft and do I serve the people a little bit better? Do I care for the people more than building the buildings and doing all this wild stuff? What should I do? That's where he's at. Now he's got a couple people in his ear when it comes to advice, advisors, counselors. He's got one group that had been with King Solomon, his dad, for years. It was the older generation. And they saw the effects of it. You know, you can do that for a while, but sometimes, you know, when you have a demanding leader like that, it gets a little old. So, so they, they advise King Rehoboam, the new king, hey bro, pump the brakes, just ease off a little bit and your subjects will serve you. It's gonna be all good. But then he had another group of advisors in his other ear, and they're like, bro, if you soften up now, people will take advantage of you. No, we're going all in. You thought King Solomon was bad? We're gonna up the ante and make it even more harsh. We're gonna tax them even more. So here's the picture. You're the leader, and this is just a good picture of you and I, isn't it? When we are making decisions, we have a couple people in our ear. We got some counsel, that's not biblical, it's kind of like, you know, kind of opinion, kind of let's do this, and then you get someone else in your ear that sound biblically, hey man, you probably should pump the brakes, do this a little bit. And I've, I've been in this situation several times. I, I, uh, I wanted to give you a picture of this practically. Uh, recently, well really, for the last 12 years, I've had this kind of a dream job on Thursday nights and I, I commentate on high school football on this TV program the last 12 years. And recently, ESPN called. They heard about my awesome work in high school games. I'm just joking with you, by the way. But <laughs> randomly, like somehow, miraculously, ESPN calls me. They're like, I want, they, 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 they called and they said, we want you to do Iowa State's first game as a color commentator. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, pinch me. Like, this is a dream job. I love it. So you'll see it. I took a couple of pictures of it. And um, I had, so this is the, my buddy Mark, he was the play-by-play. -play. I actually had to wear a tie. I, I, I never do that, I don't know what I was doing there. And there's a picture of it before. But notice the headset right there. And I wanted to draw your attention to the headset because when you are, are announcing a game like that, there's someone in a truck and they are the director. And so they know the entire program when you're, go, when you're gonna go to a commercial, when you're gonna have different uh, graphics that are gonna come up on the screen, what you're gonna about to talk about next. So there's a director in your ear the entire time. And I've had good directors <laughs> and bad directors. I've had directors that knew exactly where we were going, well-prepared, articulate, smooth. And I've had also unprepared, chaotic directors. And, and for this one, I've never had a better director. This lady, she was, well, she was so smooth. She was just like, and we're gonna go to commercial in five, four, three, two. And she'd be like, now we're gonna come out of 
this commercial. We're gonna have this graphic up on the screen. And she was just like this the whole time. This director in my ear was like, oh, dude, I know what's happening next. This is great. She's in my ear. And guess what? She set me up for success. <laughs> I've had some other directors though. <laughs> I don't know what the heck we're doing. Just dive, wing it. We've said this a lot, and this is so true, so forgive me if I'm redundant. Whoever's in your ear is gonna steer. And this is not just music and media, but your mentors, your counselors. Who you and I consult with, there will be a result of who we consult with. And the question is, a couple things. A, what decision do you need to make right about now? And B, the people that have been in your ear where has it brought you thus far? Specifically for those of you that are on your way to giving your life to Christ. The reason you're here right now is, is you've kind of done your own thing and you've had different people in your ear, but they, they're great people, but they haven't been submitted to the scriptures and the sovereignty of God to give you that clear direction, like that lady that was in my ear. So I wanna read about this story and, and that's gonna be your question. What decisions do you need to be making right now? And who are you and I listening to? Sound good? Let's look at first verse, chapter 10, 2 Chronicles 10, starting in verse one. It says this, Rehoboam went to Shechem, where all Israel had gathered to make him king. So they're gonna, it's like the king's coronation right here. When Jeroboam, I know, <laughs> Rehoboam, Jeroboam, this is kind of wild. Just call him Jerry, okay? Just write, I just put uh, Ray and Jerry in there. When Jerry, son of Nebat, heard of this, he returned from Egypt, for he had fled to Egypt to escape from King Solomon. Now, now pause there real quick because I just wanna draw your attention to this contextually. Rehoboam, Solomon's son, was going to be the next king. But during Solomon's reign, reign, there was a guy named Jeroboam, who we see in this text. He was a young, very successful, capable leader that Solomon noticed his leadership and delegated a lot of responsibility to him. But Jeroboam was power hungry and he wanted to subvert and take the kingdom that should have been Rehoboam's from him and actually be Israel's next king. He had this pride in his heart. In fact, there was a prophet named Ahijah. If you, and you can go back and study it, it's 1 Kings 11. And there was a prophet named Ahijah and he had this new blinging like coat on, uh, this cloak, sorry. And he comes up to Jeroboam and he says, he takes the cloak off, brand new. He rips it into 12 pieces and he gives Jeroboam 10 pieces. And he says this, Solomon has failed as a leader. I'm gonna tear the kingdom apart and I'm gonna assign 10 tribes to you. And imagine being Solomon at this point. He hears this and he's like, nah, that ain't gonna happen. And he goes to kill Jeroboam. So Jeroboam flees to Egypt until right now. Solomon now has passed away and Jeroboam comes back to the set and he joins the people, look at verse three, the leaders of Israel summoned Rehoboam and Jeroboam and all Israel went to speak with Rehoboam. And, and look what they say to him. Your father was a hard master, they said. Lighten the harsh labor demands and heavy taxes that your father imposed on us. Then we're gonna be your loyal subjects. What's happening? They're really, they're coming to lobby for a tax break. They're like, we're tired. I mean, this many years we've been building these buildings and palaces and building this thing. It's been a huge burden financially, physically. We gotta do something different. By the way, do you, you ever been in that position where your, your leader, your parent, 
uh, your, your boss is just, just crazy demanding. Anybody in here? Like, there, on one side, you appreciate it, but sometimes it gets to be too much. Your sales, you know, your sales manager is putting these sales goals way above and beyond, or a parent, you have a parent that's like, nothing is, is too good. Like, it's always super, super high. So on one way, you like it because you wanna grow, but on the other side, it's kinda like, dude, it's, am I ever gonna get a break here? Am I ever gonna get a win here? And that's the group that's, that's coming to Rehoboam at this point with Jeroboam. They're like, God, come on, just chill out a little bit. I was thinking about this, how, <laughs> isn't that an interesting tension? Because sometimes it's slackers coming to you <laughs> that don't really wanna work hard. But sometimes it's genuine people that, man, they're great workers and they're just genuinely saying, can you relax a little bit? So he's kind of in this place. And so if you're a note taker, number one, jot it down, he's gonna have a discussion. He, he's, gonna, he's gonna seek some advice as they come to, with this request. Look at verse five. So Rehoboam replied, hey man, come back in three days for my answer. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam, what did he do? He discussed the matter first with who, guys? With the, the older men who had counseled his father Solomon. So the first thing in this discussion, he goes to him, and this is what he says. Hey, what's your advice, he asked. How should I answer these people? Now pause there real quick. I, I love that he goes to sound, wise, mature counsel. But before that, notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't go to God first. And let me just, just say this just real quick, and I've shared this with you before. When you're approaching different life-altering decisions, my recommendation to you and to me, go to God first. The Bible says what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be added to you. You, you have a job change, a career opportunity. What's next? Here, here's, here's the question when you go to pray. Say, Lord, everybody say this, Lord, what are you inviting us into in this season? And then just wait. And listen to God, study the word. Yeah, get some advisors around you. The Bible says it real, real clear, and you're gonna see it right here. There's a proverb, jot it down, Proverbs eleven fourteen. I love it. It says this, where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in the what? In the multitude of counselors, there's safety. So we go to the Lord, Lord, what are you inviting me into in this season? And then ask for God to send biblical counselors into your life. Proverbs 24, six, another one to jot down. For by wise counsel, you will wage your own war and in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Now, I like what he's doing. He's, he's going to the wily vets, the experienced people first. And I, when I was studying this, I was thinking about all the amazing counselors and consultants that God has placed in my life. And, and I, I jotted this down. The, the key, okay, when we're, when we're surrounding ourselves with, the key is the credibility of the counselor. The key is the credibility of the counselor, the consultant. And a couple questions to ask. Number one, how's their character? Got some strobe lights, all right. We, number one, when you're observing and you're praying about what counselors or what consultants should be speaking into our ear, number one, the character. Does their walk match their talk? Number two, their experience. Look at, are they an experienced person? So this guy in our small group, he said, <laughs> this was really good. We were talking about this section of scripture. He said, you know, if you wanted a new set of tires, you don't go to the grocery store clerk and ask them like what their opinion is about what tires they should get. Where do you, where do you go? Discount tire or wherever. You go to a tire pro because they know what they're talking about. One of my favorite coaches who I love and hate all at the same time right now is my fitness coach. And he happens to be on the front row. I'm not gonna point him out right now, but I love him and I hate him, and, but, but here's, here's why I asked him, not to just coach me, but our entire staff. We have these staff workouts on Fridays and, and everybody hates them, but we love them all at the same time. But 
when, when, you, when you bring someone in your ear, when you bring someone to advise you that has the character and the experience, this is the type of guy you're talking about. You know, if you, if you go to the dentist and you walk in, he's like, hey, you know, he's got some snaggle tooth, like, no, no, you, I look at my coach, I'm like, that dude, okay. He, he, his, his walk matches his talk, his experience, I've seen him consistent. When I show up, he's like, let's go, let's go. I got energy right away. That's the, that's the type of consultant that I want on my team. That's the type of coach that I want speaking into my ear. And so here's your question. The people that are surrounding you and speaking into your ear right now, look at their life. You know that wild Uncle Larry that thinks he knows everything about everything and trying to give you advice? Look at his life. Or Aunt Bertha, you know, it's talking about, oh, honey, I'll tell you exactly what. But yet, you don't see the track record? Be very, very careful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the parenting advice that I've gotten over the years. I'm grateful for the marital advice I've had over the years. I had a counselor that I met with every other week or maybe once a month for years who every single time talking about marriage counseling, talking about life counseling, every single time he brought me back to the word of God. And I miss him dearly. He, he, he went to heaven a, a couple of years ago. I miss him dearly. But you know what? He was in my ear so regularly. It was so powerful. And I looked at his life and I'm like, that's the type of guy I wanna be when I'm in my 60s right there. So who is it that is speaking into your life? These older dudes, they're wise. Watch what they say. He comes to them first. This is ear number one that they're speaking into. Verse seven, the older counselors replied, if you're good to these people and you do your best to please them and give them a favorable answer, watch this. They will always be your loyal subjects. Good advice. What are these old, wise counselors saying? They're basically saying, yo, Rehoboam, is, if you just take care of your people, they're gonna serve you with great hearts. And I would just say parents, business leaders, leaders in general, this is such good wisdom, isn't it? Care for your people, care for their hearts, serve them, love them. Such wise counsel. I, I got this counsel, speaking of counsel, one of my <laughs> favorite counselors in my life for a season, the way he counseled me was through comedy. And I'd be in a really tough season leading the church. This is probably year four or five. And he'd come into my office and he was our youth pastor at the time. And he would sit down and he would counsel me and he'd see, man, I'm like overwhelmed. He'd crack a few jokes. And next thing you know, I felt totally different. But then I remember one time we were kind of financially in a place where we wanted to take some risk, but it was gonna be dicey. And he gave me some of the best counsel that I'm gonna give to you right here. It was so good. And he told me about a time he was leading this ministry called the Hope Center for Kids. And he had this heart to do something in North Omaha to help people, but it was gonna take a lot of money to be able to build what he wanted to build. And he was praying through it, and he said that the Lord spoke to him, and, the, and God spoke to him, probably not audible, but spoke to his heart and said this. He said, Ty, take care of my kids, and I'll take care of the cash. And I'm like, oh, man, that's good. Take care of my kids, I'll take care of the cash. He was starting to get focused, and I was starting to get focused. How do we do this financially? And it was such a good word to me to go, you know what, take care of my kids. The people that are showing up, how do we invest in them? How do we care for them? How do we serve them in this season? God will take care of the rest. And wouldn't you know it, here in year 14, it's exactly what he's done as multiple small groups are happening and different leaders are caring for people like never before, God continues to provide in miraculous ways. I was thinking about how this applies to parenting. And uh, I thought I would give a quick word on, where's my parents again in here? Let me just see all my parents, future parents, okay? This has been something big on my heart lately is caring for our kids. One just quick word of advice, take it or leave it, when raising children, something that is super effective 
is lead with encouragement and positivity. Lead with that. Now, tons of love, we, we, we say this all the time, tons of love, tons of, consistent, con, tons of discipline and consistency throughout. But I would lead with love. Someone say lead with love. So, so what, here's what happens. If your two-year-old does one thing right, dude, celebrate it. Bake a cake, be like, yeah, let's go, great job. And you affirm good behavior. You lead with that super strong. Your teenage daughter that is 99% evil but does one thing good, like, to, I'm just messing with you. Like, like, take her out for some nail date and get her a new outfit or something and be like, man, I just love your attitude lately. It was so good. What are you doing? You're leading with love. You're caring for your kids. And when you make deposits like that, when you need to make a withdrawal and get the rod of discipline out and eliminate your teenager's closet and take it out and just give her one outfit for a while, listen, you've already led with love. You're caring. And that's the word of advice. He's like, you can continue to lead like Solomon and keep all, ah, uh, or you can ease a little bit, man. And, and their discernment their genuine counsel in his ear was like, relax, man. Relax a little bit. Just care for the people. If you do that, they're gonna serve you, man. They're gonna give you all their heart. Great, great advice. I wrote in my notes, employees don't leave companies, they leave people. They, they leave <laughs> people. So, so where are we at? Helpful heart, heavy hand, where are we at? So great advice, but he's gonna have some advice in another ear. I want you to see it, verse eight. But, everybody say but. Uh-oh, I like, yeah, I don't like buts in the Bible, all right. But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elder, of the older men. And instead, he asked the opinion, uh-oh, of the young men who he had grown up with him and were now his advisors. Someone say fumble. That is a major fumble right there. Verse nine, what is your advice, he asked them. How should I answer these people who want to lighten the burdens imposed by my father? Now watch this counsel. Again, these are younger, you know, the hip, the hip dudes, the culture, the, not the old fuddy-duddies. This is the new people. Here's the young men replied, verse 10. This is what you should tell those complainers, those softies who want a lighter burden. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Yes, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm gonna make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. Oh my goodness. Uh, clearly different advice. The old dudes, the old wily vets, they've been around Solomon. They discern the season. Hey man, lighten up. The young dudes, prideful, that grew up with him, probably a little spoiled, entitled a little bit. Nah, man, tax him even heavier, heavy hand. And I don't know how many of you would be transparent enough to admit that you have led by a heavy hand in the past. Anybody in here? I know I have my natural tendency, how I was raised by many coaches that would get in your face, the more painful it was, the more stressful it was, the better. Bring it on, embrace the pain. And so for many years, and I still, if I'm really honest with you, I struggle, heavy hand, helpful heart, heavy hand, like I, I still struggle with that. It's a tension, because on one hand, you don't want slackers just to like, exist, you know, and get a paycheck, you know, it's like, what, you know, it's like, what are you doing? But at the same time, you don't want to put these heavy demands on people, and they're like, bro, like, it's not what I signed up for. Anybody, you know what I'm talking about? I remember early on, it's probably year four or five as well, our staff had a mandatory meeting, and Cap reminded me it was at 5 a.m. I thought it was 6 a.m. He told me it was 5 a.m., and we came together, and we listened to Pastor Chuck Smith teach on the book of Revelation at five in the morning. And if you were a minute late, we would shut the door and you had to go back home. Like who does that? And you had to pay $100 into the kitty that we would then give away an outreach. 
if you were one minute late. I'm like, who does that? Well, sorry, I'm just being honest with you. Heavy hand. And this, this, this mom of young kids showed up one minute late. I shut the door and said, go home. Who does that? She's probably up all night, you know, taking care of these kids. And, and now I'm sending her home like, ah. Can you guys just pray for me right now, by the way? Just extend your hand my way. <laughs> Not a heavy hand, okay? <laughs> a heart to help me. And I'm like, who does that? My parenting at times, sorry boys. I think I softened up a little bit too much in high school, by the way, but I, I, I was very diligent. My wife would look at me like, why are you so open hand? Oh, okay, so it's the tension. Do you, do you get it as a parent as well? It's like this tension that happens. So what advice would Rehoboam take? Whoever's in his ear is going to steer. He's got the older wise generation, experienced, he's got the young, he's got both. It's almost like you got God on one shoulder, you got the devil on the other shoulder, you know what I'm talking about? Like, what do I do here? Number two, if you're a note taker, you can write it down, decision. So he has this discussion, he's trying to discern what to do, and then he's gotta make a decision though, in verse 12, three days later, after Jeroboam and all the people returned to hear Jer Rehoboam's decision, just as the king had ordered, but Rehoboam, what did he do? He spoke harshly to them, pridefully, for he rejected the advice of the older counselors and he followed the counsel of the younger advisors. He told the people this, my father laid heavy burdens on you, but I'm gonna make them even heavier. My father beat you with whips, but I'm gonna beat you with scorpions. Yikes. The whip was just a leather whip. The scorpion was a leather whip with pieces of like bone and glass on the end of it. He's basically saying, you thought it was bad with Solomon, watch what's gonna happen now. Can you just imagine at that point what the response is from the people getting that word? Oh, awesome, I'm glad we're on your team. I'm just imagining... And I was thinking about, why did he make that decision? And this is just, you know, again, this is extra biblical, so take it for what it's worth. But I, I think that he had an inferiority complex and he was insecure to his dad's leadership. And now he's overcompensating because of what Solomon had done. He's like, I'm gonna make it even worse for you. And I wonder how many of us have this insecurity and we're leading out of insecurity as opposed to identity in Christ. And I might be different than my daddy, but I'm just gonna be who I am. What advice are you taking? What decisions are you making? I was reminded of this story, such a powerful story. It was a key decision in this woman's marriage. And what had happened what had happened, it was this, this lady who was married to a pretty popular guy. Uh, he was an actor. And this woman, such a wild story because they had a housekeeper that came from a different country and she was always in the house whistling and, you know, she'd be just serving, sweeping and, you know, just like our worship team. She'd be just like, ah, you know, she'd just be like just going after it. And the lady, like, watched this housekeeper, was like, man, what, what is it? Some, something's different about this woman. Here she is, a servant in our house, and yet she's got this joy, and she's singing. And, of course, many of you know, it was Jesus in her. And this woman looked at her, and the housekeeper led her to Christ. She gets, she gets saved, radically saved. She's like, oh, my goodness, this is amazing. She starts going to church. She's like, you know, just going for it. And now she's kind of in this pickle. We call it unequally yoked, which means in marriage, sometimes it happens where you have one person that's like, I'm all in with Jesus. Like whatever his word says, I'm all in. And then the other spouse, God bless them. They're good people. They just haven't had the revelation of who God is to go all in. So what ends up happening is you have one, you have like unequally yoked things happening. You got one going in one direction, one in the other. 
So talk about big decisions. This woman had a key decision to make. Do I stay married to this Hollywood actor who is an alcoholic and kind of loses his temper or do I just split up now, leave him and go find like, you know, a Christian dude or whatever to, to get married? So she's in this place of decision. What is she gonna do? And she's getting different advice, just like Rehoboam. One set of people, her, some of her friends that, ah, you know, oh, whatever, like, you know, don't, just do what you wanna do. Like, and just completely not biblical advice at all. And then she made an appointment and she met with this pastoral team and the pastor takes the Bible <laughs> and gives the best word of advice to her. And it was out of 1 Peter 3. And I want you to see this. This is so good. And perhaps this could be you right now. Maybe you're in this place of, what do I do in my marriage? And one of you really wants to pursue the Lord and the other one's like, ah, what do I do in this, in this case? First Peter, Pete writes this, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the word, they're not a Christian, they don't really wanna follow God. They, these, these, these dudes, Without, this is the key, <laughs> okay, watch this, ladies, if this is, without a word may be won by the, by the what? By the conduct of their wife. And you could flip-flop this. Say you're a dude, you really want to pursue God, want to do it God's way, and, you're, and your wife just isn't quite there yet, haven't, hasn't had the grace revelation of who he is to go all in. The pastor brought this this text to this young woman and said, hey, for the next 30 days, when you get out of bed, go right from the bed to the knees and just pray for him and then serve him, serve him a cocktail, serve him with kind words. Let your conduct, spirit-led conduct flow through you to change him, to draw him, not reject him. And talk about, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a woman, clearly, <laughs> but I don't know if I could do that. She, by faith, does it. Day after day. <laughs> and it's funny, because she tells a story. The husband would, like, get out of bed and, like, trip over her and be like, what are you doing, you weird Jesus person? Like, what are you doing, pray? And, and over time, just as God reached her through the, the housekeeper, over time, God reached this man, Hollywood actor, through his wife. Time after, well, how was it? It was not without, it was not with words, it was with her chaste conduct. It was advice. And she, at that point, has two things in her ear, and I'm just gonna tell you, whoever you, whoever's in your ear is gonna steer, she took that counsel and everything changed. Her decision, follow the Lord, what he wants to do. <laughs> Rehoboam's decision, a little bit different. And number three, if you're a note taker, we can land the plane here. Finally, number three, division. Someone say division. And anytime we listen to the other ear, this is gonna be the result. Verse 15, so the king paid no attention to the people. This turn of events was the will of God for it fulfilled the Lord's message to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through the prophet Ahijah from Shiloh. Remember, do you remember the prophecy years ago in 1 Kings 11? Now it's coming true. So God saw in advance, he, he was gonna split the kingdom due to what Solomon was doing, and Rehoboam was gonna be the human instrument in his desires that was gonna lead the way. So crazy, isn't it wild, by the way, to think of the sovereignty of God and the free will of man and somehow it all works together. It just blows my mind. It's exactly what's happening in this case. Verse 16, when all Israel realized that the king had refused to listen to them, here's their response. Talk about division. Down with the dynasty of David. We have no interest in the son of Jesse. Back to your homes, O Israel. Look out for your own house, O David. Pause there. What is it? It's division. It's division. There's, there's, there's two different groups. Tragically, he goes down the wrong road. 
And now they're like, dude, if that's the way you're gonna lead, I'm out of here. And they leave. And the prophecy from Ahijah ap- absolutely comes to pass. The 10 tribes are now gonna be under Jeroboam. Rehoboam is only gonna lead two tribes. And this was the beginning of the division and, and the collapse of the nation of Israel. A handful of years later, the northern area of Israel is ransacked and taken captive in 722 BC. The southern kingdom, they, which is called Judah, the two tribes, taken over by the Babylonians in 586 BC, held captive, and, and the entire country is split. And I, as I was studying this, I'm like, that sounds real familiar to the country we live in right now. Talk about divisive and division. If you really look at it, here's the root. We have some people in our country and we have two different things going on in our ears. One is the culture, the world, the way the, the truth is. It's, it's kind of relative truth. Whatever is good for you is good for you. And then you have absolute truth. You have God's word that's never changed that our country was founded upon. And now you see no longer the United States, but the divided states happening. It's exactly what's happening right here. So you say, well, that's, that's terrible news. <laughs> I'm just bringing reality. And why am I so passionate about this? Because it doesn't have to be that way right here. This church, this community, as we partner with many other churches, as we're not holier than thou Christians pointing fingers at people that haven't had the revelation, but we're embracing people. Listen, we can actually be a, a force of good, of unity as we move forward in this as we listen to the right side right here. Amen? Thank you, Lord, for this word. So good, so on time. And I pray against the vision all across the board. We pray for unity as we listen to the right counsel, the king's counsel from heaven in your scripture by counselors that are gonna share with us truth, absolute truth. And I pray, God, as us as a group, we'd be spirit-led counselors as well, consultants sharing humbly your word, which is the best. You made us, you know how we tick, you know how we work best. And so I pray a spirit of humility across this entire auditorium, all our friends online. We wanna be a bonding force in this season for your glory. In Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I wanna wrap up, if I could, with just a moment of response, a moment of asking the Lord, what is he speaking to you? What is he speaking to me? I know he's spoke to me a lot. Is there anybody here, you're a Christian in here, and you have some pretty key decisions? Can you just slip up your hand just real quick, real quick? Got key decisions. I wanna be praying for you. Thank you for being very good. Thanks, Luke. Put your hands down, I wanna pray for you. God, I know many of us were in these interesting seasons of life. What's next? Job-wise, finance-wise, career change, not career change. Where do I live? Where do I move? So many different moving parts. And so God, we humble ourselves before you and ask for wisdom and clarity. Would you be the director in our ear letting us know what's up ahead, open and close doors as you see fit, bring clarity and unity in our family, in our future, in Jesus' name. Also wanna speak to anybody in here. The reason you're here is God is trying to get your attention. He wants relationship with you. At the end of every worship encounter, we give an opportunity to come to Christ, to surrender your life to Christ to say yes, to believe, to turn from doing your own life and listening to yourself and listening to God. So let's stand together. I wanna give opportunity to to pray and receive Christ today. If you don't have to absolutely be somewhere, if you could just stick around and be praying, it would mean a lot to me. If you're a Christian here, just begin to pray. Eternity's at stake. 
generations are at stake. I made this decision not at a church service like this. I made this decision in my truck in a snowstorm in the middle of a drug deal and a delivery of a sandwich in 1997. And God was knocking at my heart like he is many of you and he was drawing you in. I had this warped version of Christianity like you, you come to Christ, you turn in your cool card, you can't have fun in life. And the enemy just had me wrapped up. But as I sensed God speaking to me that night, he's like, Todd, you got it all wrong. I, do, I want something better for you, for your future. And if you're just turned to me, you'll repent, turn from your sin. You come to me, place your faith in me. I'll change your life. And I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm living proof of the gospel. 25 years later, here I am. I can't even believe I'm like the last person you would ever choose to be on a stage preaching the good news of Jesus Christ to you here today. It's funny, God's got like a sense of humor. I'm proof, the proof's in the pudding. There's nothing good in me, it's God's goodness. And he's reaching out to you. He's like, just, just, stop, just stop trying to do it on your own, man. He, he wants to take over your life and bless you. So how, how do we do it here at this church? In a minute, this lovely band's gonna play a song. It'll be a song of invitation. If you're listening online, this is for you as well. As the band plays, the challenge is for you to make your way forward right here, and I lead you in a prayer. The prayer's powerful, it's simple. If it's authentic from your heart, I'm telling you, it's life changing, eternity changing. And the prayer sounds like this, God, open up my heart, I invite you inside. I need forgiveness. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe in what you did. I want life change. I need someone else in my ear. I'm telling you, man, everything changes. We don't earn our way to heaven. None of us are, are good. No, not one. But Jesus, the God-man, lived the perfect life. He died on that cross in our place so we don't have to. He was buried three days later. He rose from the tomb and now he sends his spirit. He said, just come to me, believe in what I've already accomplished. Turn from your sin, follow me. I'm gonna bless your life both now and into eternity. If that's what you want, that's the invitation right here. There's no headlocks to heaven. There's simply a hand reaching out right now saying, just grab me, follow me. I wanna speak to you and lead your life. If that's what you want, as the church prays, as the band plays, you come forward, you come forward now and give me the privilege and honor of leading you to Christ right here at Love Church, November, fall, come on, baby. So begin to pray, God's speaking to you, you come right now. for me to be a part of your lives and to share with you. And let me just speak to someone, maybe you're still deciding, biggest decision of your life, by the way. There's still room for you. And so, there's, there's a thought that some people have in their head and it's, but you don't know what I've done, pastor. I've gone too far. There's no way that I can be forgiven. Can I just tell you, it's the biggest lie that keeps people away from Jesus. It doesn't matter what you have done, what you have said, no sin is too gnarly for Jesus to pay for. He's done it all. And it's simply your free will choice to say, God, I'm all in. 
like these ladies. So cool, all ladies up here. Is there any men that wanna join these young ladies that say, man, I, I'm all in. I need forgiveness, I need a change. I need someone else steering my life. Anybody else? Well, ladies, looks like you're leading <laughs> and you're powerful. God wants to do miraculously above all you could ask, think, or imagine. And it's my privilege to lead you in this prayer. And I would just invite you to pray out loud after me. Pray out loud after me. Say, Lord God, I open up my heart. I invite you inside to be my God, to be my savior, <laughs> to be my friend. Forgive me of all my sin and wash me clean. I've decided today to follow you, Jesus. From this day forward, I'm all in. <laughs> Fill me with your spirit and lead me in a life of love for your glory and to help a ton of people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love it. So cool. Listen. Before you go anywhere, congratulations. I got a couple of friends to my right over there. All they wanna do is give you a Bible and continue to pray for you. So if you wanna head that direction right now, one more time, church, let's give it up for these awesome ladies. So amazing.